Good afternoon, and welcome to season two of CNU Talks Live at Lunch. I'm Baxter Vendrick and your moderator for today. This monthly series is brought to you by your Christopher Newport Alumni Society and the Office of Alumni Relations. And we are so thankful for the great interest and engagement from our Captains for Life through this series. Season one was filled with great presenters from President Kelly to Alumni Society Board President Nate Fontaine. The episodes brought you information about athletics, the arts, the community captain program, and student community engagement. We plan to bring you excellent presenters and topics this season as well. Of course, all of season one's episodes are available on your YouTube channel, so if you have missed any, please check them out there. Today, we are honored to have Professor and Chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religion and the Dr. Tracy T. Swartz Endowed Professor of Humanities, Dr. Kip Reddick. Kip is a 1988 graduate of Christopher Newport and began teaching here in 1991. His professional interests are vast, but his specific research interest centers on the study of wilderness trails as sites of spiritual journey. While he is well-published and revered academically, students adore him and is often spotted in his trademark Hawaiian shirt and burks while on his bike. Kip has led countless trips to the Appalachian Trail with students and the alumni with whom I have spoken have often said that that trip was life-changing or one of the most incredible experiences during their tenure at CNU. And today at the conclusion of our talk, I will share with you about a hike led by Kip that alumni are able to attend next month brought to you by the Roanoke Alumni Chapter, or as they say, the Appalachian Captains. In 2020, Kip received the Alumni Society Award for Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring, a prestigious award given annually to one professor at the Latin Honors Ceremony. Kip is an incredible asset to our family our faculty, and a cherished member of our Christopher Newport community. He will begin today with sharing some thoughts, and when you have questions, please type them in the Q&A area. And once Kip is ready for questions, I will read some of those as long as time allows. This session will be recorded and shared to our entire Captain for Life community at another time. And with that, I turn it to my friend, Dr. Kip Reddick, class of 1988. All right, thanks a lot, Baxter. All good? All right, so um, welcome everybody. Let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen uh, with with you guys. Um, share, and then I'm gonna hit the, uh, the slideshow. So, um, after 25 years of uh, doing research, uh, my book on the Appalachian Trail came out in October, and so uh, a lot, a lot of my research and publications have led up to that. And uh, I just have a couple of slides of different publications. I did a 2011 through hike of the AT on sabbatical, which became uh, the basis for the book. And prior to having done that sabbatical. These are the various writings that I had done. And then after the uh, through hike, these other uh, publications have since come out. And then finally the book. Uh, I started my own journey uh, uh, in this area of wilderness as uh, a site of spiritual journey back when I first got out of the Marines. So this picture, this picture is from um, the late 70s. Um, my my uh, soul brother John Wilburn is in the red shirt, and um, and I am uh, there on the right of the screen. Uh, John had challenged me right after we got out of the Marines. Uh, I had I had a dis disability. I I uh, I'm a disabled veteran, and the Marine Corps gave me five thousand dollars in cash as a result of the disability. And I was just going to blow the money on partying. 
And uh, my brother here, he got out the day, the same day as I did. He challenged me and said, he said these words. He said, man, we are blowing it. Uh, he called me Kippy. Kippy, we are blowing it, man. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're in a spiritual rut. And I said, what, what does that mean? And he said, we're, we're just going down the same groove and we need, we, need to, uh, we need to do something different. So I asked him, what do you have in mind? He said, uh, let's take that money and buy backpacks and go up on the Pacific Crest Trail. So that's what we did. And here is uh, here's our uh, a picture um, on that journey. And then this is me uh, coming out of the uh, Mount Lassen um, National Park. The, if you'll notice John here um, wearing blue jeans, that is not something you see anymore. Uh, that's <clears throat> that's an old way of doing things. We've learned quite a bit about hiking since those days. Uh, there, there's another shot um, up in Northern California. Um, this this is kind of cool. Uh, uh, it's one of the serendipitous moments um, that uh, that happened out on the trail. The trail is a, a small community, but uh, this last uh, year I took a sabbatical and did the Continental Divide Trail as part of my research. And this 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 video, this short video, is from my last day on the Continental Divide Trail. I, I ended it in Wyoming. I had flipped around and I came down to the Wind River Range. And on my last day, I was I came across um, this hiker here. So let me let me sh sh shoot this video here. OK, so we're just walking down the trail. I'm going north, north of Dad's, north of Dad's Lake down here on the Continental Divide. And little bird is coming south. And we meet at the trail and we just say something like, you know, have you been to this meadow, blah, blah, blah. And she says, oh, have you through hiked? <laughs> familiar. And his voice sounded familiar. Yeah. Yeah. And so we both were on the AT in 2011, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is, uh, this is, uh, a picture of little bird here in the uh, cowboy hat in 2011 from the through hike. So this is one of the the very kinds of things that uh, that the students that go out on the trail with me get to see the camaraderie uh, between hikers. Uh, they form they form uh, uh, a community that uh, that I refer to in the research as communitas. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is the uh, the plaque that is at Springer Mountain, Georgia, which is the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. This is the very first white blaze on the trail. And I start off thinking about this plaque and the relation to a spiritual journey. If you look closely, the plaque says a footpath for those who seek fellowship with wilderness. The word fellowship here is a key word. In, in the Greek, the word is koinonia, which is in, um, in the Bible, as well as the Stoic philosophers use the term, meaning to share something uh, intimately with somebody else. So that's what you do then out on the trail is, is share uh, these important, you share with the, with the community of humans and, and then also um, extra humans is what I, what I point out. I say in my book, the plaque, the plaque's invitation points to the possibility of fellowship, of participation between hikers and those who dwell along the way of sharing what each brings to the encounter. Henry David Thoreau in his essay, Walking, wrote, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Seeking fellowship then with wilderness in the light of Thoreau's uh, statement, involves a journey of restoration, of finding the essence of what it means to survive, to discover the preservation of us all, human and extra human, because our lives are inextricably bound up in a latent and life-sustaining connection with wild places. Another thing that I, that I explore with my students out on the trail is the difference between a kind of aesthetic of fellowship um, and an aesthetic of scenery. 
uh, so the aesthetic would be would be the contemplation of beauty and how beauty affects us. And so the Appalachian Trail is designated as a scenic trail, but of course it's not just scenery, there's also life that is out there. You could see this owl, this beautiful owl, uh, but, but it is a scenic trail. And so a lot of people that go out there are focused on just looking out at the scenery that is all around them. But if your focus is just on the scenery and not on the fellowship, then what happens, you, you become the center because your, your vision, your eyes put you at the center. Whereas fellowship doesn't put you at the center. It makes the center uh, <clears throat> the center of the group that, that is sharing uh, the particular uh, journey along the way. And so in this light of this idea of an aesthetic, of, uh, of fellowship. I uh, explore in, in the book a couple of instances where we have the possibility of fellowshipping with, with, some, uh, with an extra human, in this case, uh, a deer that, that, uh, <clears throat> that comes along. So um, this next shot, that's Mount Katahdin behind me right there where, I, where I'm just uh, 15 miles away from entering the, the, final, uh, the final approach. This is Thoreau Springs at the top of Mount Katahdin. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a great experience to drink right out of the water. I never recommend my students drinking straight out of water, but this of course is an exception up on top of that mountain. So this is the Grayson Highlands where this experience of an aesthetic of fellowship um, my first example takes place. This is where I take the students the, uh, 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 and the two week journey in May, the last four days of the journey, we actually spend right up in that saddle that, uh, that, that is called Rhododendron Gap between the little sharp peak and this uh, rock ridge. And uh, one year we, we were doing day hikes around here, which is what I always do with the students. And we came down to Cabin Creek and uh, and we typically will, uh, the, the students who want to will bushwhack up the creek. Um, and this is Cabin Creek right here. We come in and eat lunch by this beautiful waterfall. And then we go bushwhacking up uh, through the rhododendron off trail um, and just have a great uh, time uh, moving up. And then eventually uh, we leave the, uh, the dense brush of the creek and start climbing up the slopes of the mountain. Um, there then, as we climbed through the slopes on this one particular year, it started to rain very lightly. And as we pushed through the boughs of these uh, young fir trees, uh, we, <clears throat> we were getting completely soaked. And so I steered us away and I found a clearing. This is not, this is not the clearing here, but, uh, but it's uh, something like this. We came out into this clearing and, uh, and, started walking across the clearing and I noticed off to my right or left, I'm sorry, off to my left, I noticed a deer and she was standing just at the edge of the wood, flicking her white tail. Uh, <clears throat> I wondered what in the world is she doing? And so as I continued to walk with my students behind me in single file, I continued to walk and I, I was perplexed by her flicking her tail, seeming to gesture to me to pay attention to her. And then finally in my bewilderment, bewilderment, a thought came to me and that was, she wants me to see her. And then I wondered why. So I paused and I pointed her out to the students. Just then the person who was closest to me got my attention and pointed down to the ground I had just stepped over a newly born fawn. The doe had already cleaned this little one, but it was and it was nestled down in the grass, its fur wetted with the heavy mist, and it was slightly shaking. The class quickly gathered round the fawn, and for about a minute, we silently gazed at this wonder. We then continued up the slope, a hush falling over the group. Later, we chatted about what took place. That doe had been trying to draw our attention. 
before we reached her farm. She was signaling, gesturing with her tail for us to follow her. She did not leave the spot after we saw, but stopped and continued to gesture as we encircled the fawn. She was giving herself to us. That is, she was making herself manifest in the loudest possible way. This was no gesture of friendship. A translation of the gesture might go like this. Here I am. Look this way. She was not seeking approval the way a, a child might when it calls to its mother, look at me. She simply wanted our attention. That is, she demanded our attention. Now, the little one never really moved. It lay there, curled up in the grass of it as if invisible. Another gesture of giving itself, wrapping itself in invisibility. This reminded me of my own childhood when I lay frightened in bed and drew the covers over my head, feeling safe from the monsters. I was proclaiming to the monsters, I'm not here. Was this the meaning of the fawn's stillness? After all, the bodily gesture was a form of proclamation, even as the light rain fell. So that was one great example of interacting with a deer and its fawn. Another example took place in the Shenandoah National Park when I was on the through hike. I came around a bend, and this is an actual picture from from uh, the encounter, a mother stood there with her with her baby. And then immediately when she saw me, she ran off into the forest and left the little fawn standing there looking at me. Uh, I then stood shocked, not knowing really what to do, uh, startled. And then the fawn slowly began to approach me and came to within a meter of me. Its eyes and its face probing, uh, probing me, seemingly not knowing what I was. It was almost as if uh, the fawn was, was saying, what is this that's standing there? Uh, and then suddenly the fawn bleated. It, it sounded just like a lamb. Ah! <clears throat> and then I decided that I needed somehow to get out of this. So I said to the fawn, I'm not your mother. And of course, it stood there shocked because of my probably proclamation. I wasn't shirking my responsibility. Actually, I was proclaiming it because I was a danger. I was a threat a potential uh, uh, um, threat that is to this to this baby standing in front of me. The fawn's body jerked back just slightly, and then uh, and then eventually it shakily walked off of the trail. A uh, very different experience of a deer and and uh, the baby and the mother in this instance. Uh, and then um, up in uh, another part of Virginia. Uh, as I was alone walking on a through hike, I came across a mother and uh, and the baby on the trail, walking about fifty meters in front of me. And so I slowed down as as not to interfere and not to intrude, and I followed them at a very slow pace, less than one mile an hour, for maybe uh, ten minutes. And then eventually she turned around and looked at me. And that's when I shot this picture as, as she turned around and looked at me. And then, and then she turned and continued to stay on the trail in front of me for the next 15 or 20 minutes, again, walking very slowly. And I was wondering if she was ever going to let me go by when finally she stood, uh, she walked a little bit off the trail and, and then stopped right right within 10 meters of the trail and and then looked at me with her fawn right there and it was amazing to me that she would do this uh with someone like me who's a threat notice that she's standing on the other side of her fawn that is her fawn is between me 
and her, which was an amazing kind of uh, thing for the mother to do, right? It would seem to me against the mother's instinct to do something like that. As It was as if the mother were, were, were saying to me, look at my beautiful uh, baby that is here. So what a, what a great sharing that was um, with with this uh, with this with this fawn, and then there there they are again. Uh, and then a final a final experience that I'll share uh, took place um, uh, partly anyway in the context of a high of a class of students that I took up to the hundred mile wilderness in Maine, and there. Uh, there on the uh, shore of Lake Namakata, which is um, coming up in a couple pictures here. This shore right here of this lake. Uh, we were seven days into, into the trip and uh, the students were used to it by now. And they, they decided since the weather was good that they would cowboy camp along this shore that night. So uh, they were all stretched out in their sleeping bags and as my custom is, I wake up very early in the morning and I woke up when there were still a couple of stars left in the sky. And I came down and kindled this fire at fire pit. And I sat there watching the sky begin to change. And I thought, should I wake the students up? Uh, and I decided to let them sleep. Uh, and I watched again as the sky changed until at, at, at least an hour later, the sun broke the horizon of the mountains in the distance. And suddenly I was overcome with, uh, with a feeling of bliss, of absolute, uh, as the Hebrew goes, absolute shalom. Uh, I, I, I began to, in this experience of shalom, I thought to myself, I am in the perfect place. I have been deposited here by a cosmic vortex. There is no other place I would rather be than right here. And of course, I was with my students who were surrounding me there on that shore in this beautiful moment. And then after, after the experience of, uh, of that shalom wore off, maybe 15, 20 minutes later, I suddenly had a pang of guilt. I thought, how could I be in the perfect place here with my students when my family, my wife and my children are so far away in another place? Then, then I decided to reject that thought because being present here with my students on this shore and enjoying it in that way makes it possible for me to be elsewhere when I am there and to be fully present uh, with whomever I am with at the time. And so that was a very powerful thing uh, on that. And this is the lake uh, at that shore. And when I was on my through hike uh, of the trail, I decided to stop there at that, at that shore again with this guy trucking. Uh, and we shared that same lake together. And there we are, uh, I'm he and I stood up above that lake. Mount Katahdin is behind us the next, the next day after we spent the night at that lake and shared something of the same kind of experience that I had uh, with my students. All right, so those are just a few of the things that, uh, that I could go on and on forever and ever <laughs> probably, but, uh, but I think... Um, it's a good time to have questions and interaction. So I'm gonna stop sharing uh, right now and come back to this. So um, Baxter is sort of gonna lead us, I think. Well, Kip, I, I think it's already been voted that you have to do an audio version of your book because uh, it, I think, Everybody was just fixated on your voice and looking at the photos at the same time. And I can only imagine the amount of emotion uh, that went through some of our alumni listening to you, uh, like being right back into your classroom again. 
So I swear to God, I did not um, put anybody up to this first question, but where can I get a copy of your book? <laughs> well, it actually is is selling on Amazon. Um, it's a it's a it's an academic book. Here here's a copy right there. It's an academic book. Um, so Lexington Press, uh, but because it's academic, is it's more you know it's it's more expensive than uh, than usual. Um, but it is on Amazon for sale, um, and uh, you know, and Lexington as well, and other booksellers are selling it too. I noticed. I think Barnes and Noble has it on their website as well. Well, we have dropped the link into the chat, so folks who are uh, eager to buy a textbook again, um, it's right there for you. Um, our next question comes with uh, this. What changes have you noticed along the trail over the decades? Uh, probably the, the greatest change that has affected the trail is uh, the cell phone. Uh, my first class uh, of taking students up on the AT was in 2002. And in 2002, we did not get cell phone service uh, except maybe in very, very, uh, like a road crossing, when the trail crossed a road on some road crossings, not all of them. So very, very little cell service back, back then. And then uh, even at, like, I think around 2000, six or seven i can't remember which year one year one year um we were about three days into the journey and one of the students twisted her ankle um and uh and uh, needed you know needed to to have an evacuation and um and a through a through hiker was with her uh, that is someone who's hiking the whole trail and that's what we're doing on my classes interviewing and getting to know these through hikers the through hiker walked all around this mountain, uh, you know, up high to get cell phone service so that he could call, uh, call um, the uh, the local uh, rescue squad uh, to bring ATVs up the mountain and get her uh, off the mountain. But now, now you can get service almost anywhere out there uh, on the trail, and I think it it affects the fellowship. I mentioned the fellowship uh, earlier. Uh, when a, a, a lot a lot of hikers then instead of us uh, you know sitting down to rest um, in a group and having chats a lot of people will just jump right on their phones uh and uh it really affects things uh as well uh so that that's probably the biggest change that i've seen out there next question how can we cultivate encounters like these in our everyday life outside of the trail? Oh yeah, you know, um, uh, I, I uh, discipline. There's a discipline. Okay, the, the the word discipline in the Greek is ascesis, uh, and we get the word ascetic from that. We 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 misunderstand what an ascetic is when we think of hair shirts and sleeping on nails or something like that. Really, really uh, the best way to think of a discipline, uh, an as ascesis would be uh, the sports analogy that, that anybody who wants to excel in sports must discipline their, their, their whole being uh, so that they can excel in whatever sport they want. And so I think we need a spirit, we need spiritual discipline too. And to cultivate these kinds of encounters, uh, what I, what I, what I have my own, my own spiritual discipline uh, is that I take, I take a four mile walk every morning in, in a, a on a wooded trail. Um, and there are plenty of wooded trails, you know, around here and, and in, and in other places uh, as, as well. Uh, just to spend time uh, apart from my phone and apart from any any uh, anything that would distract me, um, you know, uh, one of the quotes that I that I love that I put in the book too was uh, uh, was from from Thoreau, and uh, he he talks about when he goes out in the woods, he he he's uh, he's all, sometimes distracted from being there in body. 
and he finds that he's thinking about some business, right, that he has somewhere. And he says that he must shake off the village uh, so that he can be present in spirit uh, there in the place. And that's what I think I, I need. I need that every morning. Uh, the way I start my day is uh, is to, to, to take a walk. And then that cultivates the encounters, not just in the woods, but then on, on campus. When I come to campus, I want to be fully present with my colleagues. I want to be fully present with my students. Um, and that kind of discipline, uh, I think, helps to cultivate um, to, cul to cultivate those encounters. I hope I answered that question. I think we could all just keep listening and listening to, to you, but we do have more questions. Um, <laughs> what has been the experiences of the students who have gone on your trail hike? Um, like, tell us a little bit about their various backgrounds. Like, are they religious, not religious, and sort of everything in between? Okay, so so uh, I actually get a mix of both religious and non-religious. I get a mix of every kind of background you might think. I would say, I would say that uh, eighty-five percent of the students who come out with me do not have any kind of background in hiking or backpacking or, and sometimes even in camping. I have, uh, I just uh, on, on uh, Facebook this weekend posted one of my favorite pictures from a past year where uh, uh, one of my students was sitting with the wild ponies up in the Grayson Highlands. That particular student uh, his first class was with me was in the 100 mile wilderness. So he was on that beach sleeping by that fire. And uh, he had never been camping before. And then here we are in the 100 mile wilderness. And I remember uh, after the first 10 miles on the first day, uh, him walking into camp and he was shaking. He, he was shaking because he was weak. He, the, the, the hike had exhausted him completely. He was pale. I could tell that he was completely exhausted. And he walked up to me in, that sh in a shaking voice, shaking hands. And he said, Dr. Reddick, I don't feel very good. Uh, <clears throat> and I looked at him and said, you know what? We all feel the same. <laughs> I said, that's what this hike does to you. I said, just go over there and sit down. And, uh, and then I, I, I turned to two of the students who were doing much better than he was. And I asked them, would you make him some hot chocolate? And they did. And they, they fed him the hot chocolate until he recovered. So I have students who, uh, who have never done it before, uh, who some, and a, a couple, maybe 5% who have done it before, uh, who, who come out and, and, uh, and thrive in in the place um students who come out and uh their lives are changed i i know uh one one example of many is uh is um a, a month after returning to campus and then the students going home for the summer i got a note from a parent of a student who who said uh my son is a completely different person after coming back from the mountains and uh, of course, it was a positive uh, change in in their son, uh, a taking on a responsibility. Uh, so, so lots of different backgrounds, uh, lots of different experiences. Not everybody has a positive experience. Um, you know, some people really do um, uh, bump up against something that uh, that overwhelms them. Uh, but uh, but it's great to to be with. Uh, to to show to show people the wonders that are out there, uh, so there. I hope that answers that question. I I, I don't normally say the name of the folks who um, ask the questions, but in this case, I am, um, and I'm just going to read it verbatim. And this is from Todd Shockley. Um, Hi, Doctor Riddick. Good to see you. Um, first, you got to bring back the beard. 
<laughs> this could have its own PhD. Uh, second, have you found your sense of connection between the present and the divine to differ based on the different trails? For example, have you had different experiences on the PCT as compared with the AT, the Camino, et cetera, based on its uh, topography and other and each trails offers? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Todd. It's, it's great. It's great to uh, to have a question from you. I'm glad you're out there. I've, I have such fond memories of you. I remember, I, I believe, uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, that we were um, we were in Oxford walking behind Modlin College, and came across a woman walking on the on the Addison's Walk, and um, she greeted us with such a wonderful greeting, saying, "Saying, such a fine day to be out here with the woodland fairies." <laughs> right. Uh, Yes, I, I do think that there are differences in these places um, based on topography and, um, on, and on the ecosystem. And that's one of the things I write about in, in the book um, is that I, I, think, I think that the Appalachian Trail, because it's a dense forest most of the way, it is, um, it's conducive to to a, a certain kind of experience that that some scholars call flow. And I, and what I've what I've done is uh, I've uh, renamed that experience in terms of <clears throat> walking on the trail. I call it canonic walking, based on a passage in the New Testament in Philippians. Uh, Saint Paul writes that uh, even though uh, Christ was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and became a servant. And that word in the Greek, emptied himself, is, kin is kenosis. And so this, this flow experience, I think, is like a, kin a kenosis, an emptying of yourself, of the ego, and the and the trail the uh, being in the dense forest, uh, and walking day after day after day, I think is conducive to having those kinds of canonic, uh, canonic experiences. Whereas, say the PCT or the CDT, uh, you you end up in much more open country, and um, and so you have these grand vistas. And again, when you're when you're having a lot of these grand vistas and and your your vision is the primary means of receiving information. It kind of puts you at the center, instead of emptying yourself. Then you become you become the center of everything. So the the AT is really interesting in that way with this dense forest. Some people some people that are um, through hiking do not like the dense forest at all, and so some some have have actually called the AT the green tunnel. Um, and uh, I remember the one, one instance I, I write about in the book. Uh, some of you may have been, I don't know if anybody's out there right now that were, was in this class of, uh, on the AT with me when the youngest at the time, the youngest female through hiker was, was uh, on the trail and she did finish. She was 14 years old and uh, her trail name was Chipmunk. And, um, <clears throat> I, I heard her speak about a year or two later down in Georgia. And she said, she said, uh, some, well, somebody asked her, what, what's the best part of the trail? And she said, it's the people. And she said, I really didn't like walking in the woods, not because it was scary or anything like that. She said, quote, she said these words, it's just a bunch of boring trees. Right, I couldn't believe that she said that. <laughs> Just a bunch of boring trees. Well, it's those trees uh, that hem us in, that uh, that that help us. I think to uh, to come to an end of ourselves as being so important. When you're surrounded by so many trees uh, and such grandeur, uh, um, it kind of knocks you off the center. So, uh, so I think. Um, that's something unique about the uh, the AT. 
um the cdt has its has its also its thing too it, it's it's just so hard it's just they call it uh and when you're walking the cdt the the phrase is embrace the brutality uh, uh and uh and and so you come to an end of yourself in a different way uh out there uh but yeah so so uh, various trails do various things to you depending on the uh the ecosystem and uh, and and your companions too thanks todd thanks for for the question uh i also have to say that he todd quoted lovely day to be a woodland fairy uh, so just had to point that out there. Um, yeah. and, uh, another comment that was made by uh, Chris uh, Gabro that he said, I just want to thank CNU for doing this. I miss seeing Kip every day. And oh. I hope the entire philosophy department and please give Dr. Barley my best Kip. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I miss, I miss my, uh, my conversations with Chris. Uh, as well um so yeah thanks chris um taylor quinn says uh hey kip uh any thoughts on an alumni trip or excursion uh and then he has another question to it i also hate to ask if you've started to think about retirement hopefully no time soon <laughs> i would love to uh to have some kind of you know, like week long hike or whatever with, with alum, that would, that would be amazing. Um, you know, some, somehow we, we should all organize something. Uh, and I, as for retirement, um, I, I'm not thinking about it. Uh, I'm not thinking about it yet. Um, I'm just going to go, you know, and may, maybe, maybe one day I'll just disappear in the woods and that'll be my retirement. Who knows? <laughs> Um, Bruce asks, I expect the experience with students is different than a solo walk. Do you also go on solo walks? If so, how would you describe the difference in those experiences? Yeah, as I, as I said, my sabbatical in 2011, matter of fact, Taylor, uh, who just asked that previous question, was in my class the year that I took off on the sabbatical walk. Um, so, so yeah, I, I've done two sabbaticals where I, where I walked uh, without students. And I've also um, done a couple of other, other longer hikes. I've done two Caminos without students and I've done, I think six Caminos with students. Um, and, and so it is, it is very different when you don't have students uh, out there. Um, I, I um I do have, you know, I experience a lot of stress because of course I'm concerned about uh the safety of the students and but but I also you know I I really want to create um a a kind of class where the students can come to the end of their their selves too and and that's you know that's a that's a tricky thing uh, you know that that, that I mean that the, the uh, going out in the wilderness is dangerous. Um, lots of things can happen. And, you know, and I've met, I've just mentioned one student who twisted her, her ankle. Um, you know, we've had some, you know, some injuries that have happened out there. And, uh, and I, I do, you know, find myself stressed about those kinds of things. Uh, whereas when I'm with on a, on a solo hike without the students, um, I don't have those same kinds of stresses um but but uh but i i i you know i find i i feel like i'm called in my life to share these things with um with students with other with other people and so even though i cherish solo hikes i i uh also know that i'm called to uh sh to share these experiences uh, with others, especially with uh, with these students. We're going to go to our last question, and this is from Bill Mann. Uh, the photos of the deer reminded me of our responsibility to be good stewards of our planet 
and all of the life forms it supports. I'd really be interested in hearing your thoughts and how we can best accomplish this responsibility. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I love the idea that, you know, um, response for me, the word responsibility uh, is so important. Um, uh, and that that's why I I often in my writing, you know, uh, interact with uh, with the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, uh, because Levinas uh, emphasizes this this idea of mutual responsibility. Um, I, I love this quote. This is a quote that I didn't read while I was presenting, but uh, but it it relates to what you're saying and it relates to the deer. You know, when I when I was looking at this baby, uh, this this little fawn was looking at me. We were face to face with each other. Um, I, I thought about this quote. I used it in the in the book in this passage. Levinas writes, "The other becomes my neighbor precisely through the way the face summons me, calls for me, begs for me, and in so doing recalls my responsibility." And calls me into question. Uh, so I, I I think that's what happens when you look into a face. And of course, I I I think that uh, we can also experience the face as we're as we're standing in front of a tree. It may not have the same kind of face, you know, with eyes and nose, but but the tree has being. The tree is alive, and uh, and it calls for me to be responsible calls me into question. And so I, I like the word responsibility much more than the word sustainability. And so that, that is one thing I like to explore with the students, what these, you know, as a philosopher, I think about the words, think about the language. Uh, what, what is, what is the word responsibility call me to versus the word sustainability call me to seems to me that sustainability calls me towards the use of things. Of course, we have to use things, but it calls me toward kind of an efficient use of things, whereas responsibility calls me in a different direction. It, ca it, 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 it calls me to community with uh, the, the ones that I'm uh, sharing the world. Um, that is the koinonia, the fellowship. So responsibility is a really important word, I think. Kip, for the last 50 minutes, I have felt like I was in class, that I was mediating or meditating rather, and also at church all at the same time while being filled with inspiration. I don't know how I audit your class, but I certainly want to now. And it underscores the the statements that I have heard um, time and time again by alumni about their trips and just their time with you. And I imagine those alums who are on this call that did not take a class with you are like, darn it, I missed out on, on taking one of your classes. You have set the bar, Kip, for season two of uh, CNU Talks. And we, we thank you for all that you do for our students in our entire community. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank uh, you, thank you. What, what a great, what a great thing. What a great uh, blessing for me to, uh, <clears throat> to be able to interact with some of the, some of my former students and some alums, maybe, maybe, maybe they weren't my students, but we shared this campus, right, with each other. And, uh, and we got to share this, this time, this short amount of time. Even if it's virtual, we got to share something. Absolutely. Um, and Taylor Quinn, I, I heard you earlier about the the alumni trip. So this is this is my moment to lead into a uh, a mini version of that. Uh, I had had mentioned much earlier that the Appalachian Captains, aka the Roanoke Alumni Chapter, is putting on a hike with Kip the weekend of September twenty seventh and twenty eighth in Bedford, Virginia. So regardless of your hiking skill level, uh, there are really options for everyone. And I encourage each of you to come sort of join some incredible captains for this event. 
More information on how to register will be shared with all alumni, but those who have participated today will receive the invite shortly after today's Zoom. And please know that it's not limited to just Captains for Life, as you may bring others to join you. And next month, we will have with us members of the Wasson Center for Civic Leadership to discuss one of their latest polls in this presidential election year. And I will turn over my moderator hat over to Grace Charlin, class of 2021, our Assistant Director of Alumni Relations. We will be sending everyone a link to today's episode, along with the link to RSVP for next month's episode in early September. Again, thank you, Kip, and, uh, and thank all of you for joining us, and we will be seeing you soon. Take care. All right.